I am glad that two weeks ago I ended actually at the end of a point, so I wouldn't have to pick up in the middle of something uh, with that much of a gap put in there. Uh, but uh, a couple of weeks ago we were talking about Satan, talking about the scriptures that sometimes are used in regard to his fall and, and what may or may not have happened in that, and we looked at those and saw a lot of the symbolic nature of some of those texts and that some of those texts really have uh, very little, if nothing, to do with the actual original fall of Satan and, and his angels. We also uh, concluded there at the end that there really is no way to fight God. That's just not a possibility because of God's omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. I mean, you just can't do it. Even the ability to choose to do such a thing is an ability that God allows us to have. And God can remove it if he so chooses to do that as well. And so the thought or the idea that somehow there is some kind of ability to attack heaven and somehow try to rebel or take, you know, take God on is something that simply Scripture won't support. And I think in the end we have to be very careful that we don't somehow lower God from where he is to some kind of idea of what we are or even what angels are, even as they are so, they may be higher than us, but they are still infinitely lower than the God that created them. And so, you know, that's where we concluded. I think we will probably finish next week on this class. Uh, That's going to, I'll, 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 figure out what class I'm going to do in between that and VBS, which starts in two weeks. and We'll be doing the, the classes for VBS during the month of June. We have a summer series in the month of July. And then in the month of August, we, I will be answering your questions. So if you have questions, if you have some questions that you've uh, been wanting to consider, don't, don't, don't give me those mean ones. Give me, give me nice questions. Um, you know, write those down. Email them to me. Um, you can uh, write them down on a piece of paper, put them in the contribution boxes. I'm sure Gail, when she takes the stuff out of those, she'll get those to me. And uh, we'll begin, I'll begin to populate uh, those lessons for the month of August. But I, I want to make sure that we answer your questions. Because I know from preaching that I can preach for an entire year and never answer a question that's bouncing around in your head uh, that you're wondering about. And so I want to be able to have that opportunity to help in that way, and if, and if I don't have an answer, I'll tell you that too. Um, but uh, we'll do our very best to uh, look in God's Word and find a biblical answer to those questions. All right, let's talk tonight about Satan's angels. We talked about Satan, talked about his fall, and, and now let's talk about his angels. You know, Satan's angels are those who followed him in disobedience to God. Now, how he influenced them or whether they simply have the same kind of pride against God is unknown. Why they made the same choice that he made, why they went down the same path that he did uh, is not laid out for us in Scripture. They fell for the same reason, though, because they did what they wanted to do instead of what God had said to do. And that's really at the heart of any sin at any given time, whether it's human or angel, it is the violation of, of what God has said, of God's will ultimately. We must never think that they are Satan's angels because he somehow created them. He didn't create them. God cre- created them and they made the same bad choice that he made. But it is simply they are called his angels because they followed him in that. They did those same things. He was the first but they also followed in that same path. The sin and the subsequent fall of the devil's angels, well, it's an ancient teaching. This isn't anything new. This isn't anything that popped up a couple of centuries ago. Uh, This is first seen, the idea of this. I mean, outside of Genesis chapter 3, this is first seen going back probably close to 4,000 years ago. When in the days of Abraham, Eliphaz spoke to Job in Job chapter 4 and verses 18 through 19. And this is what Eliphaz said. He said, he puts no trust even in his servants. And against his angels, he charges error. 
How much more are those who dwell in houses of clay, whose foundations, foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before the moth? Now, when we're looking at Job, and Eliphaz is one of those friends, that, right? I, I, you almost have to put friends in quote, don't you? Because kind of, they, they get a little ugly uh, before it's all said and done. But the friends that come to talk to Job, and you know, most of the book of Job is this interaction between him and these, these three friends as they try to convince him that he is, he's done something wrong because if you're suffering, you have to have sinned somehow and God is punishing you. That, that, that's what's going on here. And so when we look at what those men say, when we see what Eliphaz says, then we have to always understand that that's not inspired. Even the argument that Eliphaz is making is wrong. Now, God has put it into scriptures. It's inspired from that standpoint that God chose to record it. But Eliphaz's statement itself is not an inspired statement. He's speaking, and he's speaking erroneously uh, in regard to what Job may or may not have done. So he mentions the fact that God does charge his angels when they sin. And the point is, Job, if God charges his angels when they sin... What do you think about us? And he, talk, he calls us houses of clay, right? Our foundation in the dust. Uh, those are terms for mankind. You know, Paul would even say that the gospel treasure is in, in pots of clay, right? And that's us. He said, how much more is he going to do it for man? How much more is he going to charge error to those that do wrong before him? So this is an argument being made just a little over, or around 400 years after the flood, in about 2000 B.C. The doctrine of fallen angels is divinely established in the New Testament. We can walk away from Eliphaz and, and go to the divine account, and we can see it in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 and Jude chapter 6. Go ahead and open your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. We'll talk about that one first. Then we'll, we'll, draw, we'll jump over to Jude and verse 6. Peter says, in 2 Peter 2 and verse 4, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Now, while we would say that Eliphaz's argument was was wrong, his statement about angels, at least when you put it with Peter here and Jude in a moment, you're going to see that his statement in regard to angels was absolutely right. His application of the statement is ultimately what was erroneous. Well, Jude 6, I'll go ahead and mention what that says before we come back and look at Second Peter a little closer. Jude says, And angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode... He has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Now, if you look at those two texts, you're going to see that they are very similar. They're, we would call them sister texts. I mean, they're, they're, they're almost saying the exact same thing with just minor changes in the way that it's said. Just consider these things. Peter says that he's talking about the angels. Jude says he's talking about the angels that fell. Peter says they, he, he words it as the angels who sinned. Well, Jude's wording is like this. Those who did not keep their proper domain but left their own habitation. They're saying the same thing. Jude's just saying it a little longer, isn't he? Peter's a little more concise with just they sinned. Peter says that he cast them down to hell. Jude says that he kept them in eternal bonds. Peter says he committed them to pits of darkness while Jude says they're under darkness. And then Peter says that they're reserved for judgment, and Jude says that they are waiting for the judgment of the great day. Well, let's look at Second Peter. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Now, one, one would not want to try to build a, um, a doctrine on... on concerning fallen angels from this text beyond one fact <laughs> they fail <laughs> that's really the only doctrinal 
uh, fact that you're going to be able to establish in regard to that is that they factually did fall. The mentioning of angels is incidental to the real teaching of the text. The teaching, the text is not about angels. That's what we have to understand. That's not what this text is about. People will jump to this verse and they just kind of focus in on it. But the, the teaching that Peter is, is trying to get us to understand has, is not about angels, but it is about the surety of God's judgment upon man. Um, verse 1, we see that uh, he begins the chapter by warning about false teachers and the need to, to deal with them. Look at what verse 1 says. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers where? Among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. So God's judgment upon such is shown as sure with the example of the angels that sinned. He then goes right into the surety of God's judgment as he looks at the example of God's judgment upon the ungodly in the flood of Noah and the sinful cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He lists all three of those times in which we see God's judgment enacted against either angels or men, right? That sinned against God. So in this text we see fallen angels, a fallen world, and fallen cities. And God's judgment coming down on each one of them. These false teachers are in opposition to God and they will most assuredly be judged. Now the angels in this text, as they are used as an example of judgment, have a number of things said in relation to them. First of all, they sinned. They did that which was in opposition to God's will. There is no implication here of some great battle. They simply did that which God commanded them not to do. And it can be as simple as that. And I don't really know any reason why it has to be more than that. I mean, do we understand how simplistic the fall of man was? You ever taken a bite out of an apple? <laughs> Just about that simple, wasn't it? To eat of a fruit that God said, don't eat. It wasn't a huge thing, but it was disobedience. And, and so... You know, I, I don't think we want to imply anything beyond what is set forth. And then he says that they're cast into hell. And the Greek word for this is totaros, uh, tartarosis. And this is the only time that this word appears in the New Testament. And there is no Hebrew equivalent. So this is the only time we see it in the Bible. Now, a lot of times we'll say it might be the only time we see that Greek word in the New Testament, but there may be an equivalent Hebrew word that we can look back in the Septuagint or we can look back in the Hebrew Bible and we can see examples of how it was used by God in other places. But in this particular case, this is the only instance in which this word is used. And it is a word from pagan mythology. And, and you know, some, some make kind of the mistake of saying, well, Peter's borrowing from the pagans. Well... I would make the argument that probably the pagans are borrowing from God at some point. And, uh, you know, because, and it just fits still because it ultimately comes from the same place. But it is a pagan word from pagan mythology that is the place in the Hadean realm where disobedient souls were punished. Now we can understand that, right? Why that word would have a, a meaning that would be applicable to um, the New Testament. So some tie this location to the place of torment in Luke chapter 16 as we look at the rich man and Lazarus. And, and I don't have a problem with that per se. I, I think that there are certainly some ties there that we can make and uh, certainly it fits in, in, a, in a number of ways. The word used for torment there though is not tartarosis. It is the Greek word bosonos and it means pain or torment and it's found only three times in the New Testament. But it does have a similar feel. Now... While translators 
uh, have translated this word here in Peter, hell, it's probably not a very good translation. Um, in the New American Standard, I, don't, I didn't look at other translations. I know King James Version, that this number is going to be a lot higher uh, because they also translate Hades as hell as well. But the word hell is found uh, 12 times uh, and it is the word Gehenna. It is the, the Valley of Hinnom uh, next to Jerusalem, the place where they had, uh, had the altar to Molech, where they burned children in sacrifice. It became so um, defiled that it became the garbage dump of Jerusalem. And it is the word that Jesus used when he talks about hell. It's the word Gehenna. Eleven times hell is the word Gehenna with this one exception where they translate Tartarosis as, as hell. Probably not a... I mean, certainly I don't think it's a good, a good uh, translation. It does not seem to be the final place of punishment, but a place of holding until the final judgment cast the devil and his angels into Gehenna, into hell uh, one day. And hell is, the Gehenna is, according to Matthew chapter 25, as we look at the judgment scene parable there, hell is a place, it wasn't created for you and me. Hell is a place that was created for the devil and his angels. Now we can follow them there, join them. But ultimately, its creation was for them. And that's where they're going. They're not there yet because both Jude and Peter make it clear that they are waiting for the judgment day. For that great day one day where that final judgment will come down. And they will wind up in that final place of punishment for them and for all those who join in their ways of sin. We need to understand that the devil is not the king of hell. It is not his kingdom. It is his prison. It is his future place of punishment for all eternity. He's not some king there. It's not his kingdom. It's not some place that he's ruling over. He's going to wind up in the same place as everybody that listens to his lies. I had a thought when I was going through this. And, you know... 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 makes it very clear to us, and, and I don't, I wouldn't presume to tell you definitively how that, I have some ideas, I think we've talked about this before, but Peter tells us there that for the person who has come to know salvation, the person that has become a Christian and turns away from the salvation that God has given to them and returns back into the world of sin, it makes it very clear that hell will be worse for that person than it will be for the person who has never known. Like I said, I don't know all of why that's the case. Part of it, I think, is probably the knowledge that you, didn't have, that you had the opportunity not to be there and you gave it up. A lot of regret there for all eternity. But whatever it is, that's a reality. And I got to thinking, if that's the case for me as a Christian, that if I turn away from Christ and, and having thrown away what had been already given to me and had, I had possessed in my life, how bad is it going to be for an angel? who's literally been in the presence of God. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if the, if the, if the comparison's equal. I don't know if, if the reasons why it would be worse for us would be applicable to angels. But, you know, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? To have been in the heavenlies with God Himself and have thrown that away for whatever reason the devil chose to throw it away and his angels how much worse will hell be for those beings now both the images in this text 
and Luke 16 show a place of punishment, but not the punishment of hell that will come after the judgment. Certainly, when we think about the rich man, it was not a pleasant place, was it? Just have Lazarus get his finger damp with some, just a little bit of water and come touch my tongue. But somehow that would give him great relief. For I am tormented in this flame. But that's still not the final hell. It's not the Gehenna. I suppose there would be an argument for demons being fallen angels, as we've talked about before, who for a time were allowed to leave this Tartaros that Peter mentions here, but knew that they would be returned to be tormented again. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 29, where Jesus says, or they say to Jesus rather, Have you come here to torment us before our time? They knew there was a time coming that they were going to be in a place of torment, and whether Jesus was going to exercise obviously his power to make accelerate that time frame or not, they're asking him in that particular instance. Peter says, as well of these angels, they are committed to pits of darkness. And again, our translations are a little bit odd on this. It sounds similar to, you know, when we, when we read pits of darkness, it sounds similar to the demons speaking of the abyss that Jesus could return them to in Luke chapter 8 and verse 31, where Jesus says they were, or the demons again say to him, they were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. When we think about a pit, right, that would fit that idea of an abyss. But the word translated their pits is not really the word for pits or for a hole in the ground, whatever, however you want to uh, say that. Uh, the better translation comes from the ESV, and they translate it, chains of, of gloomy darkness. I don't, know, I don't know about the whole gloomy adjective there, <laughs> but chains of darkness would have sufficed probably. Um, but we must remember that this commitment to darkness and torment would also apply to the devil as he was, or is, also one of these fallen angels. And like I said, the word pits here is actually a word that means cords or chains, fitting that ESV translation very well, that it means cords or chains or fetters, restraints in other words. That they are in a place of restraint. And, and I think, you know, when we think about the darkness, these, these restraints of darkness may also simply be used to indicate their spiritual separation from God. That difference between darkness and light that John likes to use so much, that, that very strong uh, contrast between that which is right and that which is not. Listen to 1 John chapter 1, verses 5, and se- 5 through 7. And this is the message we have heard from him, John says, I've heard from Jesus, and announced to you that God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. And if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie. And do not practice the truth, right? But if we walk in the light as he himself, Jesus, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, right? Because we're both in the same place. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And so you can see that, that separation there between what is right and what is wrong and, and, and where we live. And certainly these angels that have sinned with no hope, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, of no hope of, of any kind of a change of status from that standpoint they are going to be chained in darkness with no hope of being unbound from such a place. These bindings or restraints may show us the devil's being restrained by God. The devil cannot act independently of what God allows him to do. I remember one man who told me, 
I remember a man, when I first preaching job I had, he said, men going up into space and into the moon are sinning because God said there's a boundary that he doesn't allow people to go past it, and they wouldn't be able to go past it. <laughs> because if God puts a boundary out there and he says that you can't go there, you're not going there. I'm sorry. I don't care who you are. And the devil cannot act independently. He has been confined to operate only as allowed. Isn't that what we see in the book of Job? We're going to look more at that tonight. But is that what we see in the book of Job? That he's only able to act within a parameter that God allows him to act within. Even when we look at the disciples, Jesus said that uh, of the eleven that the devil had requested the permission to sift them. But he had to request permission. He couldn't just go do what he wanted. He had to be allowed to do certain things. And God can restrain him. And he is under restraint by God. The chains or cords may indicate God's restraint of the devil and his angels until they are ultimately cast into hell that was made for them. And this could also be a part of the reason that Peter used a unique word like tartarosis, a word we don't see anywhere else because he's describing the current dwelling of these angels who sinned and they are constrained to a particular existence unique to them as God has determined. I wouldn't even presume to know the, the operation or how all this operates in the spiritual realm, as I don't know, and the Bible doesn't tell us a lot about it. But it tells us enough to know that they are active. They're even active in our world. Uh, and, and so, you know, God has restrained them and confined them uh, within a certain parameter that he has determined and I think that's one of the safer ways or places for us to land on that. These statements must be considered with the implications that some of these sinful angels, devil included, are functioning in that warfare taking place in the spiritual realm uh, that we examine when we talked about the book of Daniel. And even when we see the devil and, and his actions uh, in the book of Job and other places. The devil is already under a punishment by God. We looked at that two weeks ago when we saw in Genesis chapter 3 that God cursed him, right? Because of what he did. That he violated what, you know, he lied. And God is truth, and God can't abide in lies. You will not surely die. That's a lie. Because it was in direct contradiction to what God had said, which was truth. And so, you know, he was condemned then and cursed then by God and was lowered or pushed down, as we talked about two weeks ago, to uh, beneath, to the lowest levels of dust. Then Peter finishes up with, they are reserved for judgment. The angels who sinned have no opportunity to change their conditions. Anybody here thankful tonight that we do? Well, that's just something we should almost always be thankful for in our prayers, shouldn't we? That I have the opportunity to change. Because the angels don't. Their bad decision is a bad decision that has condemned them for all time. Now, that's where we were at before Jesus Christ. But that's where they are at all the way, well into, all the way through into eternity. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 16, writer of Hebrews says, For assuredly... He does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Now, verse 17 of that text then speaks of Jesus becoming a man in order to save man. I mean, we had a price that we had to pay, and the man had to pay it. And so Jesus became man to pay that price, but he did not do that for the angels. Some commentators even say with verse 16 here that instead of give help, it should be translated taking hold, as in Jesus never took hold of angels' nature, but he took hold of the nature of man. And he never was an angel or never took on that nature, so he couldn't pay the price for angels. He didn't, wouldn't, for, what, for God's reasonings did not do that. They are reserved for a certain judgment with no chance to change. Why? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why. 
but angels, you know, you, you kind of, when you think about it, angels have seen it all, haven't they? Anybody here living to living for Christ so that one day you can see heaven? Have you seen it yet? Well, that's very hard of faith, isn't it? Some of the things so far is an evidence of what? Things not seen. I haven't seen it. But when you think about angels, they've seen it all, haven't they? They saw it all and they gave it up. They saw it all and they threw it away. And, and maybe that's part of it. But God is more patient with us because we haven't seen it all. He gives us the opportunity to live to see it. Uh, you know, to follow Him so that one day we can see those things that angels have seen and yet those that have sinned, Satan, they have thrown away. Men who sin are moving toward the same judgment as angels but can change that judgment through the work of Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection for mankind. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 3, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved. That's that same word, reserved for judgment, he says about the angels, but that's the same word, reserved in heaven for you. See, their judgment is reserved. It's certain. Let me tell you what, you live your life according to Christ, according to what He has given, that imperishable seed, you plant that in your life and let that grow, then your home in heaven is just as assured as the, angels condemn, the sinful angel's condemnation. It's reserved for you. It's waiting for you. Sinful angels have no such choice, and their choice to sin was the final one to determine their end. No other choice now will change or affect in any way that end. Angels that sin are bound in darkness, the darkness that of sin, of that sin and separation from God. They are in an existence determined by God and one that has only one end. And that's hell in the final judgment. Peter's point is to never doubt the surety of of God's judgment upon those who sin. Folks, don't think you can live your life however you want and God's not going to call you to account one day. There is a surety to it. And that's the whole point of this text. There's a surety to God's judgment upon those who sin. Specifically in this text, when we're looking contextually to this, there is a surety of those to those who are false teachers. I don't spend the time I spend studying so that I can present lessons charismatically or in some way that will please people. I spend the time studying that I study because I want to make sure I'm right. Because every word I speak from here or from there or from anywhere, God's going to hold me to account for that one day. And that's... That's, that's sometimes scary when, when I think about it. And it should be, and I hope it always is. I, I always am nervous when I get up to preach. I don't know how many... I preached in excess of 2,000 sermons, I think, but um, uh, I still have butterflies for the first couple of minutes of preaching until I kind of get rolling, get going fast, as y'all say. Um, but, uh, you know, I always want to be... I always want to be that way. I talked to a preacher who preached for 50 years, and he said, I still get nervous too. He said, and I'll quit preaching the day I'm not because I've forgotten how important it is that I do what's right. Well, let's jump over to Jude. Jude, verse 6. So hard not to say chapter 6, isn't it? Jude, verse 6 says, And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Believe it or not, what Jude is talking about is the exact same context as what Peter was talking about. Jude is dealing with false teachers. I mean, the two men are teaching almost identical things with identical illustrations. 
Verses 3 and 4 of, that, of, that, of Jude say this, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith. And that faith there is the system of faith. Truth. I want you to contend for the truth. Make sure that you are making certain that truth is taught and truth is known. He says, which was once for all handed down to the saints. We're not looking for any more handing down. For certain persons, here they are, have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. And then, I love where Jude goes then. Verse 5, he talks about the Israelites, doesn't he? He says there were Israelites that were delivered from Egypt, from slavery, only to go out into the wilderness and be destroyed, right? Because of unbelief. Now what's he saying to us? Is that we can be delivered from sin and we can go right out there and still be destroyed because we're not believing as we should or we don't believe what is right and true. So there's an importance to hearing and teaching those things that are right. And God's judgment is certain as Jude is setting forth here. And in this particular case, Jude uses the angels and he uses Sodom and Gomorrah as proof of God's judgment and the surety of it. Now Peter added the sinful people of the days of Noah, but Jude doesn't include that. He, talks, when he says about the angels, they did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode. Domain is their office or their habitation. The angels were create the angels created domain or office was to serve God. By the way, that's ours too. In case we missed that, uh, Solomon tells us that right. That the whole the whole conclusion about life is that we're here to serve, fear God and keep His commandments. That's our whole duty. No, through sin they chose to leave this domain. They chose to leave this habitation of service to God. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17, God said to, to Adam and Eve, But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Now we know, all we have to do is go up a few verses, right, to chapter 3. And we know they didn't physically die. I mean, they didn't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and drop dead on the ground, did they? But did they die? Absolutely. They died the minute they disobeyed God. They died spiritually. They were separated. Death simply means separation from, separation from something. And they were separated from God. They died that day. They, separ they were separated from the God they were created to serve. Adam and Eve also choose to not cho chose not to remain in the place that they were created to occupy either. Jude goes on to say about angels that they abandon their proper abode. That means one's own house. That they abandon their home with God and with the heavenly host in order to sin. I don't know about y'all, it sounds an awful lot like the prodigal son to me. I'm going to leave the Father's house, right? So I can go off into the faraway land of sin and sin. So I can live like I want to live. I can do what I want to do. Now, because the prodigal is man, he can come home. Angel left home, he doesn't get to go back. But what happened as a result of these actions by angels? God's judgment happened. And it will always happen. That's the point. It is sure and it is true. It says, He has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. These eternal bonds. Remember Peter used those words chains, chains of darkness? Same thing. These chains, these bonds here, Jude tells us, are eternal. These sinful angels will not overcome these bonds ever. And again, Jude makes clear that these bonds will hold them till they are ultimately condemned and cast into the hell created for them. I find it interesting. I, I, as I thought about this, I thought about these two texts and, and the fact that they were 
hitting on the exact same point and using the really the only two texts we have in regard to these angels. I found that interesting. I found it interesting that Peter and Jude chose to use these sinful angels as an example of God's judgment against those who would teach that which is false. The devil is the father of lies. It is his nature to lie. God's nature is truth, isn't it? I mean, when God speaks, it's the truth. Never anything else but. And on the other end of that spectrum is the devil, and everything he speaks is a lie. Because he speaks from his nature. That's what Jesus said. It's not Nathan's opinion. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 44, he said, You are of your father the devil, and you do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and, a father of, and the father of lies. He told the first one. He's the father. All lies after have been lies after his. You ever heard that old saying about somebody that you can't trust? How do you know they're lying? Their mouths are moving. <laughs> That's absolutely the truth. If the devil has a mouth and it's moving, it's a line, folks. That's just the way it is. And, and, and you can be sure and certain of that because Jesus Christ himself made that statement. False teaching, when we think about that that's the point of, of what Peter and Jude are talking about, false teaching is teaching that which is in opposition to the truth of God. And folks, if it's in opposition to the truth of God, what is it? It's a lie. I know we got a problem in our world today, don't we? About... Truth is whatever it is to whatever person out there. I'm sorry, there are truths out there that are truths no matter what you think about it, whether you like it or not. They are true. And things that are said in opposition to those things that are true, those are lies. Because they are trying to make you believe that that truth isn't true. And that's a lie. And that's what the devil does. And that's what we have to be aware of. The devil at the very beginning told Eve, you shall not surely die. That's a lie. It's not the truth that God spoke in chapter 2 and verse 17 that we read just a moment ago. He said something different. He only added one word, but it made it a lie, didn't he? At the heart of false teaching is a lie that opposes truth and leads people away from God. It deceives them. Isn't that at the very heart of what, when Jesus described false teachers in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, what did he call them that is really a, a symbol of deception? They were wolves, how? Sheep's clothing. Why are they in sheep's clothing? To deceive you, right? You remember the old cartoon with the old sheep dog? He always had to raise his hair up. Remember the coyote? Remember, he'd go get a sheep and he'd unzip it. There was a zipper. I guess we need to look for zippers, don't we? Because they zip up their outfit. But it's all about deception. And at the heart of deception is a lie. So, I think a great example of this, Brother LaVega had mentioned to me about Micaiah sometime back a few weeks ago. 1 Kings chapter 22 and verses 20 through 22 Micaiah the prophet tells a kind of parable to King Ahab. He says, the Lord said, he said, I saw the Lord in his throne. And, the, and, and angels, the heavenly hosts were on each side of him. He said, the Lord said, who will entice Abraham to go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said this, while another said that. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, How? And he said, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And then he said, You are to entice him and also prevail. Go and do so. Now some have made the, the terrible biblical mistake uh, of saying that this somehow says that God was causing Ahab's prophets to lie. James 
will contradict that. But no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself does not tempt anyone. So let's put that aside. This isn't actually, this is a parable. This is a something for Ahab to understand something about his prophets and to have an option. The parable is to show Ahab that his prophets are, are lying to him. God has allowed them to lie and through a, and to him through a lying spirit that is within them. Now, Micaiah is the sole prophet of God there to tell Ahab the truth. There are 400 lying prophets there that day saying, go get them. Go to Ramoth Gilead and it's going to be a good day for you if you go to Ramoth Gilead. 400 are telling that lie because they're telling Ahab what he wants to hear. And Micaiah is the only one saying you better not go. He's telling him the truth. God tells Abraham that Israel would be defeated and scattered. And he said they'll be like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, there's not going to be a leader because you're going to be dead. There won't be a king anymore. Ahab tells them, <laughs> I love this because Ahab doesn't want to hear any more of it. He already had Micaiah in prison because he didn't like what he said before. He brings him out of prison. Doesn't like. Him. In fact, Ahab says, I told you he wouldn't tell me what I wanted to hear. He says, put him in prison, barely feed him, and I'll deal with him when I get back. And listen to what Micaiah said to him on that statement. He says, if you indeed return safely, the Lord has not spoken by me. Because <laughs> the Lord told me you're going to die. And so if you come back, it wasn't the Lord talking to me. Guess what? Ahab didn't come back. Well, he came back dead. But exactly what God said... But when you look at Ahab, it's very interesting. As evil as he was and as bad as he was, and certainly his wife was even worse, and Jezebel, God just kept giving Ahab chance after chance after chance after chance to do what was right. And sometimes he got close. He was, he was so much like Agrippa. He just almost would get there, and, and, and then he would walk away from it. And, and, and God here, at the very last moment, even though his death was already set forth because of his killing of Naboth for the vineyard, God, once again, gives him a chance to choose truth over lies, and he chooses the lies. How many people do we know in the religious world, and in the world in general, it doesn't have to even have to be religious, thing, that would rather hear a lie than the truth? I'd rather hear what, I mean, what did Paul call it in, as he was writing to Timothy at the very end of his life? They'll heap for themselves teachers that are what? Tickle their ears. Tell them what they want to hear. Because I'd rather hear what I want to hear than what God has to say to me. God's judgment against angels was clearly the first such judgment against sin. Before Adam and Eve sinned and mankind fell, that took place. The devil lied then and continues to propagate his lies to mankind taking them from the truth of God. Folks, no one is closer to the character of the devil than a liar. And I don't care if it's the little white liar or the big one, however you measure those. I don't know how that, I don't even know how that, I, don't, I haven't seen that scale, so I don't know how you measure them. But that's the closest you'll ever get to the character of the devil is to be a liar to be a false teacher deceiving the hearts of people from the truth of God. Judgment will be sure against such people. That's what these texts are teaching. Just like it was against the angels. You know, sinful angels chose to sin and they suffered the judgment of God. The Bible does not go into detail concerning the specifics of Tartarus and the eternal chains of darkness in which they now exist. But what we do know for certain is that the eternal place of condemnation of hell was made for these sinful angels, and one day all of mankind that rejects God and His righteousness will join them there in the final judgment. And really, if that's the only thing we understand about angels, that's a lesson we need to understand. 
There is a place created for them that I promise you, you don't want to go to. And God never wanted you to go there. That's why it wasn't created for you. It was created for them. He never wanted you to go there. He wants you to come be with Him. That's the lesson we need to learn. Follow the example of angels like Michael, Gabriel, the ones that chose God and not the ones that chose uh, themselves. Well, next week we will conclude and we'll talk about, I think I've mentioned this two or three times, I never seem to get to it, um, the devil appearing before the throne of God. We're going to talk about that a little bit in the book of Job. And uh, we're going to talk about just some aspects of the character of, or the works rather, uh, of Satan and how that those things, we're going to make some some application to our lives of how the devil works uh, in, in the church, how he works in individuals, so that we can understand how we might better fight against those things that he is uh, trying to get us to do. Let's conclude our class tonight with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've had to study from your word, to look at the truth that you have given to us, Father, and we pray that we will always listen to your truth and resist the lies of the devil and those that would follow him. Father, we are so very thankful tonight as we think about the reality that we have a choice, that you have allowed us to make mistakes and yet allowed us to find forgiveness for those mistakes in the blood of Jesus Christ. And there are no words or gifts that could ever properly thank you for that. Father, we pray that you help each of us to live our lives in such a way that one day, when we come to that sure day of judgment, that we will be at home with you. Father, we pray that you help all others as well to come to that realization and that desire. Father, we pray that you go with us now and that you be with us and bless us as you always have. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.